were in the midst of a big crisis. Some feel that the recovery is coming and that uh, the tide will lift all boats. Some believe that uh, we shall then continue happily to do business as usual without any need to affect fundamental changes in our institutions in the global allocation of resources. Let me say at the very beginning that this view is not supported by facts. And in my view, this is a rather naive, indeed a dangerous point of view. We must, we must accept that the system has been derailed. And to put it back to its rails, it calls for policy action at the global and national levels. The essential feature of the multidimensional crisis we live in is its global character. The issues cannot be contained within the national frontiers, partly because we live in an open, globalized, interdependent world, but partly because of the very nature of the issues. Three examples. The international mechanisms have been incapable to deal with the threatening issue of global warming and the protection of environment. We had a lot of discussion of that yesterday. Secondly, the international system failed to advance regulatory reforms for capital movements, banking practices, and to deal with the structural imbalances between surplus and deficit countries. Thirdly, we have not been able at the international level to establish meaningful migration policies in the face of our inability to reduce the gap between rich and poor countries. I can go on and give you more examples but I think they are sufficient to illustrate my point. Now, the failure to deal effectively with such global issues has shifted the burden of adjustment to national governments. But governments are constructed, our democracies have been constructed to do small changes on an equilibrium basis. They have not been made to take decision for big structural changes. They are ill-equipped to do that, to address themselves to such issues of fundamental systemic changes. This gap between the need to reform and the capacity to reform constitute, to my mind, a major threat to the functioning of our democracies. Now, in the absence of government action, the vacuum exists, but in real life, the vacuum is being filled. In fact, inability of governments to proceed with systemic changes led to an interesting development. Changes, it did radical changes were affected in the past from the back door. What actually happened is that politicians were relieved to turn over issues which traditionally belong to the sphere of political economy, such as full employment, income redistribution, welfare policies, to the market forces. This is what I call the game of passing on the hot potato from the international system to the national governments and from the national governments to the market system. The surrender of important political issues to the market forces in the 80s marked the ascendancy of neoliberalism 
as the new global paradigm and the decline of social democracy. Now, the recent crisis destroyed the myth that the market forces are efficient and self-regulating mechanism. And we are back now to the common sense paradigm that in our market-based, but not market-driven system, we do need regulatory framework. The game of passing on the hot potato is over. This is the challenge that governments face, and they have to respond as best as they can in an unfavorable international environment. The question then that arises is what are the minimum preconditions that must exist in order to ensure success in reform at the national level in the context of lack of decisive international action. I wish to offer some thoughts on this very difficult question, but first, let me divert a bit and discuss some definitional issues on reform. For there are many definitions of reform, and the literature offers alternative taxonomies. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm satisfied with a simple definition. Reform is a democratically agreed set of policies with specific objective and policy outcomes which inter alia involve substantial shifts in the distribution of the economic, social, and political power among major social groups and significant changes in the institutional structure. It follows that not all policy changes constitute reform. We are concerned about systemic changes. The word reform has a, a special attractiveness to politicians, and it is uh, used uh, quite often for some policy changes, but they do not constitute reform. If you change, for example, a policy instrument from one to another to affect the same objective, this does not constitute reform. If you change your policies from, say, price support subsidization to income support to the farmers, that's not a reform. I'm not talking about that. And um, let me very briefly revert to the taxonomy of reforms. We usually distinguish reforms on the basis of twofold criteria. They are externally versus internally induced reforms. And secondly, they are broadly based systemic reforms versus sectoral reforms. Externally induced reforms may emanate from pressure from capital markets, from international organizations, the characteristic feature of this category is that the legitimacy stems from the acceptance that the country has no other option but to follow other international obligations or to adjust to international norms. The IMF standby arrangements are good examples of externally induced reforms. The stabilization and development programs that are, are worked out in the context of the EU after the Maastricht Treaty are good examples of externally induced reforms. On the other hand, internally induced reforms emanate from domestic dynamics and uh, reforms of that kind related to changes of social security system, of pensions, and so forth and so on. Now, passing on quickly to the second distinction, 
broadly based systemic reforms um, are changes that embrace the entire system. Prevailing norms, values, and institutions are challenged. On the other hand, sectoral reforms do not question the validity of the hardcore values or institutions and uh, limit themselves to changes of a specific sector. Reforms in the agricultural sector, for example, health reforms, education reforms are examples of sectoral changes. To be sure, each category of reform requires a different preparations and works under different conditions. But more often than not, what we are talking about in the context of the present crisis are broad-based systemic reforms. And we don't have many examples in the recent history of these broadly based systemic changes. But the question does arise, and I come back to the question I posed earlier. What are the minimum conditions that must exist for a systemic reform to succeed? Um, having spent most of my professional life either in international organizations or in my government, with issues relating to reforms, I have pondered on this issue a lot. And I have come to some conclusions which I wish to share with you. To my mind, a successful reform requires the confluence, the confluence of many factors, which I single out the following five as most important. First, favorable external environment. It is terribly important that the set of policies which constitute the reform is consistent with the prevailing global environment, or to put it in a different way, a systemic reform in a country would be greatly advanced if the context of the reform is friendly to the external environment. I'm saying this because I lived through bitter experience trying to push internal reforms, systemic reforms, in the context of a hostile external environment. I'm not saying that this is impossible, but I'm saying that it is extremely difficult for a country to institute a systemic change in the context of a world environment which is goes in a different policy direction. Second, strong and charismatic political leadership which can capture the minds and the souls of people with very clear and simple signals and move the people towards a shared vision. This, to me, is terribly important and, in fact, necessary. Third, strong cohesion of the forces which support the reform agent. In our democracies, the governments rely on parties, which more often than not are big coalitions, bringing together various and, at times, varying social groups for the credibility of the reform to be successful, you require solidarity, political and social solidarity to institute the reform and to implement the reform. If the cohesion is very weak and if there is a threat of voting against uh, a program during the implementation, then the coalition becomes loose, and loose coalitions 
is a certain prescription to failure. Fourth, lack of emergence of organized minority groups, either political or civic, which may advance their opposition in a way that can become veto players. Veto players usually appear at the later stage of the reform uh, in strikes, demonstrations, in fact, actual obstruction of the implementation process can bring the reform to an impasse. Fifth, persistence in the pursuit of the objectives of the reform and consistency through time. The implementation of a reform requests, uh, requires time. It is not unusual that as time goes on, the reform forces lose political steam and may indeed be superseded by other political priorities, leading either to the negation of the reform or to its political devaluation. Um, well, some of you may be surprised to notice that uh, I did not include among the major five preconditions the need for a reform to be the outcome of a consensus process. I owe therefore an explanation. Indeed, during normal periods, policy packages emerge from consensus building where a balance is obtained uh, among the various and differing needs of the social groups for small changes, give and take. This is what our democracies can do and have done very well during normal periods. But in moments of crisis, we don't need this balance. What we need is to ask the social groups to transcend their narrow interest and to join forces for a new vision, a new situation, even if in the short run their interests are not served. In fact, it is this top-bottom process and that's why I place emphasis on the second condition, namely on the need for the political leadership to lead the reform. Now, if you consider these five preconditions, you will see that it will be unusual indeed to exist all these five conditions at the same time. And that's why systemic changes have been rare and very difficult to implement. To illustrate the significance of those five principles, I would like to give you some examples. And I like to avoid reference to the current day efforts in various countries, including my own country, although I'll be ready to answer questions if you have about that or what is going on or is not going on in the EU. And to be safe in my discussion, I would like to resort uh, to the remote past and give you some examples and illustrate the importance of those five points from systemic changes which were attempted in the past. And I will have five historical examples two success cases, and three failure cases. The two success cases refer to United States during the, Rose the Roosevelt era, the New Deal, and the second during the first post-war labor government, the Attlee government in United Kingdom. The not so successful cases or failure cases we refer to the Allende example in Chile, to the first term of Mitterrand in France, 
and to the first term of Papandreou government in Greece. And let's see these experiences from the standpoint of view of the five preconditions I set forth. First, about uh, the New Deal. Indeed, the external environment was very favorable indeed. The world was in the midst of a great depression and people were ready to accept fundamental changes over a very broad range. Roosevelt himself provided the required charismatic leadership and he was successful in rallying the American society behind him to support the New Deal. The cohesion, political and social cohesion, was very strong. And the opposition, which existed, political and social, could not organize itself to become a veto player. The unprecedented three terms of presidency of Roosevelt, together with the advance of the Second World War, which helped the reform, provided the New Deal with the necessary depth in time to instill the changes in the social and economic fiber of the United States. Many of the institutions that still exist in the United States are changes and institutions that were implemented in the Duny. But you had the confluence of these five factors in the success of the story. Less known, but uh, quite interesting, was the reform of the first post-war labor government under Attlee. There again, the external environment uh, was favorable to the socialist program of Attlee. After all, the people during the war became accustomed to price controls and directed government involvement in production and in distribution of goods and services. Besides, people after the war needed badly and wanted a strong welfare state. Attlee himself, not a very charismatic figure, was able to gather around him exceptionally good political leaders and that team gave the inspiration for the support of the socialist reform in the UK period. The cohesion was very strong and the opposition, which of course existed, could not rally, could not organize itself fast enough to play the game of the veto players. In fact, many of the institutions that were established during that uh, period remain for many, many years uh, later under different governments. And it was much later under Thatcher that uh, those reforms or institutions were reversed. Now, the Allende socialist reform tell us a different story. First of all, the external environment was extremely unfavorable. In the midst of the Cold War, the West was not prepared to accept the, even a democratic socialist experiment in Latin America, especially after the experience with Castro in Cuba. Multinational firms, on the other hand, with the huge stakes in the mining sector of Chile, were openly hostile. Allende was indeed a very charismatic leader who managed to rally the majority of people behind him in the first phase of the reform. The political cohesion, however, was loose. And the as the implementation proceeded, dissatisfied social groups, farmers, middle class professionals, blocked the process. 
with the substantial and sub and help illegal help and subversive help from abroad those groups became veto players the sharp social division opened the door to brutal repression by the military under Pinochet. Here you see that some preconditions existed, but not all of them, and you had a failure. Now, the socialist experiment of Mitterrand during the first three years of his first term provides us with an interesting case. The external environment, to be sure, was not very favorable, but not strongly favorable, as the ascendancy of Thatcher and Reagan signaled only the beginning of what we now call the era of neoliberalism. But France, anyway, being a relatively large and economically strong country, it could decide on its internal reforms without depending too much on the global opinion, something which had, did not exist in the case of Chile. Mitterrand was an impressive and charismatic leader and managed to articulate effectively the wish of the electorate for change. The political cohesion was also quite high. Wide-ranging reforms, which included nationalizations, state controls and planning, and the ideas of managed trade, proceeded with popular support and without the emergence of veto players. Then, after three years, suddenly, the reform came to a stop. And later, it was reversed. Not because the efforts failed. On the contrary, the program was proceeding satisfactorily but because Mitterrand changed the priorities of his political agenda. This is the question of consistency of priorities over time. Mitterrand apparently considered that it was better for France to essentially ab abandon its solitary socialist experiment and enhance the European integration by promoting the Franco-German cooperation. So here you see a case where the four conditions, precondition existed, but not the last one, the fifth. The Papandreou's socialist reform in Greece, which took place at the same time as that of Mitterrand, followed the same pattern, but uh, with the difference that the negative impact of the international environment was much more pronounced since Greece is a much smaller and economically weaker country. Papandreou was uh, also a charismatic leader and managed to develop an impressive and strong majority of support to widespread economic and social reforms with very strong political and social cohesion. And with the opposition in disarray, the reform program was implemented speedily during the first term, 81-85. Then again, while the program itself was succeeding and the reforms were in place, the process was reversed. Following Mitterrand, Papandreou considered best for Greece to go 
all the way the European way and to abandon his mild socialist experiment. We must not forget that the, at that time most European countries were turning their back to the welfare schemes of the post-war period and social democracy in Europe was in decline. Now, if we carry now those thoughts to the present day situation, it's quite clear to me that uh, it is extremely difficult to be optimistic that systemic reforms at the national level can be successful. I do not say that they are impossible, but they were very difficult indeed to succeed. And I will be very much surprised if years later on in discussions like this today, we will have successful systemic reforms examples at the national level. Because I do not see these five factors to coexist in any single country. To begin with, the external environment is unfavorable to policy packages and reforms of social cohesion that the electorates in those countries want. The people in those countries want full employment, want job security, they want a more equal income distribution. The policy packages that the external environment under which we operate, either internationally or in the context of the EU, take us to a different market-oriented solution which accentuates income inequalities and, at least in the medium run, increase unemployment. So the external environment is not favorable then I regret to say that I do not see the charismatic political leaderships in our countries. The way we pick up leaders in the recent years is a very particular question. I don't want to comment on that. But um, this is not the period of charismatic leaders. And it is a paradox in histories that we do have charismatic leaders in good times and in moments of crisis, we have leaders uh, who fall very short of the requirements of their times. Um, also, in our democracies, we still work on the basis of coalitions. We're segmented societies. Groups uh, see the world from their standpoint of view. They do not do this uh, transcendence to go beyond their own narrow sectoral social interest and uh, to support broader visions and programs that uh, go beyond their short-term narrow interests. In other words, veto players block basic changes in our societies. Now, that leads me back to where I started. Namely, that if we do not have solutions at the international level, if we do not face together these issues, if we do not create a different external environment, it is almost impossible for national governments to carry on all that burden of adjustment. I am not optimistic that we will have at the global level changes of that sort in the foreseeable future. I'm sorry to say that. But I believe that in the context of the European Union, we can and should do certain things. We should try to find a collective solution within the EU. What each country alone cannot do, all of us together can do. But to do that, we have to look into the architecture of the EU as such.
First of all, we have to complete our monetary union. I mentioned that yesterday. You cannot have a monetary union without a lender of last resort. Can you imagine the United States with the Fe without the Federal Reserve Board? If there is a deficit or a crisis in Alabama or Wisconsin, would you tell to that state to settle its deficit alone or you will redistribute the liquidity through the Federal Reserve System from the surplus, say, states of Massachusetts or, where, or Pennsylvania to Alabama or Wisconsin? If you do not have a lender of last resort, the euro will be on shaky grounds. The speculators know that, and that's what they're doing. The second thing we must do, we have to complete our economic integration. You cannot have a European monetary system and national fiscal policies. You have to have fiscal policies at uh, the European level. You cannot do the redistribution work that fiscal policy do with a, a European budget uh, of less than 1% of the collective income. To do that in a common market, it was calculated uh, before that you need 7% of the incomes of the member countries to be part of a fund, a fiscal fund, to do counter-cyclical and development policies at that level. That, of course, means that there will be a different distribution of cost between surplus and deficit countries. My German colleagues are telling me that uh, Greece has to pay for its sins because it has a deficit. But the deficit of Greece is the surplus of another country. The deficit of Greece, of Italy, of Spain, and Portugal, is the big surplus of Germany. 8% of the GDP of Germany is surplus. In other words, selling more goods uh, to the other countries. If we are going to find an equilibrium, we have to cooperate between surplus and deficit countries to find the solution that will be a solution of full employment for both the surplus and the deficit countries. The idea that you press the weak and the deficit country to have the whole burden of adjustment is not only unjust, it's inefficient. So, let me finish by saying this. I'm not an optimist that there will be a global solution. I am not an optimist that the governments alone at the national level can proceed with the kind of reforms that they have in mind. But that we must be optimists and we must fight for a better European Union. Thank you.